Coming. Coming. One, two, three. I'm indeed a privilege and honor to be given this opportunity to make a presentation to you today on, in this important forum. The privilege is all the greater because my presentation coincides with the period of momentum change in our nation and a fundamental improvement in education for all Fijians. Furthermore, today, I'm given an opportunity to speak to top executives who has this enormous responsibility in growing and developing this country of ours. You are all indeed a very esteemed group. You are our thinkers, our advisors, supporters in terms of surplus creation and employment opportunities. And ladies and gentlemen, in this contemporary world, countries will become more competitive, yet more interdependent, and their future even more dependent on the knowledge, skills, and resourcefulness of his people, creating new opportunities and difficulties for education. Integration, IT revolution, freer movement of goods and services are some of the opportunities created by global processes and can only be actualized if we continue to insist that education is a basic human right and to resist the tendency to reduce education into yet another market commodity or what economists term as private good, as a private good. Both these issues have been addressed fairly well by our government. Our constitution, for the first time ever, have a very extensive Bill of Rights, right to education, is clearly stipulated. Having said this, our Bainimarama-led Fiji First government have also allocated substantial amount of money towards funding various initiatives to remove obstacles to education of the Fijians, hence treating, treating education as a public good rather than a private good. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's a worldwide movement for education for all, initiated in Jomshan in 1990 and reaffirmed in Dakar 2000, it is the most important commitment to education in recent decades. Ladies and gentlemen, this realization and affirmation have been arrived at following convergence of the view that there is no short-term solution to alleviation of hardship and poverty, as well as provision of self-respect and dignity to our women in particular, other than provision of quality education. Education is recognized as an essential condition for human fulfillment, peace, sustainable development, economic growth, decent work, gender equality, and responsible global citizenship. It also contributes to reducing inequalities and eradicating poverty by bequeathing the conditions and generating opportunities for just, inclusive, and sustainable societies. Education must therefore be placed at the heart of local, regional and global development agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently in a period of momentous change in our nation and a fundamental improvement in the education of all Fijians. Never before have the Fijian people enjoyed the many privileges in education we are now providing to every Fijian student, be it the ECE level, primary, secondary university. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the government has always prioritized education, realizing the potential it has to boost the national intellectual capital. In the past three years, the budgetary allocation for education continues to rise to ensure that all ob obstacles to education are removed and equal opportunities provided to all aspiring Fijians. Ladies and gentlemen, with this in mind, the Ministry of Education has embarked on various reform recently to address deficiencies in the education sector and raise the performance bar to meet the demand in the national, regional, and international labor market, as well as the various sectors of the economy. Often when one talks about education, they only talk about employment opportunities and entering labor market, or as a, as a ticket to entering labor market, but they fail to realize that education also is a key factor, one of the key factors to leverage other sectors of the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, since last year, following feedbacks from stakeholders on a very serious gaps in the quality of our graduates, flaws in provision of teaching and learning in our primary and secondary school, 
an inequitable quality of school infrastructure around Fiji, we decided to adopt a three pillar reform strategy. Pillar one, with respect to improvement and delivery by our teachers in the front line. Quality teachers, quality delivery. Pillar two, improvement of school infrastructure so that we improve the learning environment or enhance the learning environment, particularly with respect to EC, primary and secondary schools. And pillar three, content review, ensuring that we have the right content. Ladies and gentlemen, I now wish to speak on several issues that people in this country, the leaders of different sectors of the economy, has been quite vocal about. This is with respect to some key variables which may differentiate between educational products. What I've noticed is over the last 12 months, there has been a major rise in discourse about education. And I welcome that. And I really appreciate that because we, we want that. We like competition coming from a competitive competition background. We want people to interrogate what we are doing. We want people to question what we are doing. It allows us to sharpen on ourselves. Let me talk about the issue of mathematics in education. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now gradually witnessing a decline in analytical ability of our students and employees. They tend not to question given facts. They tend to shy away from activities, responsibilities or assignments which require quantitative skills or they tend to provide second best or substandard advice in the absence of rigorous analytical, rigorous, rigorous analytical work. Ladies and gentlemen, Fiji is not an exception with regard to this phenomena. This is a global challenge. The findings from a year 2000 study in Australia revealed that pass rates at the lower secondary school level have been declining over the last three decades. The Afrasa and Keeves 2000 study also in get indicate that this is, there's a need to investigate differences in conditions of learning. I do not want to go too much into detail because it's more an academic uh, treatise, but those who may be interested may want to read a study by Carroll's 1963 titled A Model of School Learning, published in the Journal of Teachers College Record, Volume 64. In this study, the author divides factors into two categories, student and school level factors, with school student factors being aptitude, home background, ability and perseverance, motivation attitudes, while school level factors are time for learning and quality of instruction. The question that I wish to pose is what is the position of topics in this country with respect to mathematics for our high school curriculum? What do you think about having mathematics as a compulsory vis-a-vis -vis the current discourse that we're having? The opponents are arguing that year 12 level mathematics is not needed as it is too advanced. While I agree that it will not be needed for day-to-day -day operations, it is not meant for that. It is designed to develop and prepare a student for analytical and logical thinking. Unfortunately, people out there trying to contribute to this discourse do not understand that we need to develop people's analytical mind and their ability to logically think through. That is the reason why we want to have mathematics compulsory up to year 12 and 13, so that even so, they may not need that integration, calculus, etc., for day-to-day -day activity, but that interrogation by them to that particular subject matter will allow them to develop their analytical and logical thinking skills. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these bloggers and letter writers are not able to think this far, and I don't blame them for that. Discourse on English as our language of instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last three months, we have raised the issue of poor, poor language proficiency amongst our graduates. This issue also caught the attention of our Prime Minister. It also caught the attention of the leader of opposition, who went in tangent to what I said and took out a long statement stating that Itaikoi language is in danger. In fact, when no one was referring to Itaikoi language, what we are referring to is that ensuring 
that we live up to, the language, English, being the official language or language of instruction. As language and culture is symbiotic, given that we now exist in a global world, cultivating global literacy for a peaceful world is one of the most urgent tasks for educators and researchers, for multicultural citizens of the world. In a more sustainable global village where borders play such a minor role, global awareness, respect for other cultures and communication skills, especially communicative competence in English, is an international language, is essential and critical. English is a means to communicate to the rest of the world, the identity, culture, politics, and way of life. Contrary to what some say, one doesn't need to become more Western or change one's moral or religion to use English well in local and international situations. Countries which resisted adopting their own language have adopt adopted English as the official language, such as India, Singapore, and Philippines. English is now in also increasingly adopted as a second language in conservative countries like China, Korea, and Japan. So what is it that is pushing this move to adopt English as a global language? It is trade and business. With open economies, with global interaction, and desire to trade, there has to be one language. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot be oblivious to the changes in the global market. We cannot underskill ourselves and substand with substandard English. We will deal with important transactions and contracts. And thus, we must be highly proficient with both spoken as well as written English. Again, what bothers me is apart from few letter writers, where are our topics? What is the position of our top executives? Not a whim from them in regard to this issue, except for these regular, regular bloggers and regular letter, letter writers. You need to, you need to put your, um, voice your concerns and put points openly. You need to contribute to the debate support our efforts to raise the standard of English amongst our teachers and students so that we churn out quality graduates who will come and feed you and you know, work under you and, and contribute to your uh, business. We now talk about something that I mentioned last year as well, template driven graduates versus critical thinkers. Ladies and gentlemen, majority of our graduates from universities are template driven. They think that they can do the job as is already done at the workforce. I do recall um, some statements from yesterday's proceeding about um, work-ready graduates. Slightly different to this particular issue of template-driven graduates. Is this, this is what, is it what you want? You, the template-driven graduate, one who uh, learns the uh, textbook stuff and comes and says, I can do, I can replace the worker that we have. I can do the final accounts. I don't think so. What you want is critical thinkers who can question the existing way of doing things, bring in efficiency, and push the frontier. Without pushing the frontier, business progress will be stagnant, society will be stagnant, and the country will be stagnant. We need to breed and chain out critical thinkers. We need thinkers, a thinking society, with curiosity. Unless we have individuals in a society, in a firm, in a business, in a country, who have curious mind, we can't push the frontier. Critical requirement for innovation is curiosity, curious mind. How do we get that curious mind? How do we get people to start questioning? This is something that we need to look in. The um, educationists within our secondary school system, and of course the university leaders, some time back, we used to have um, debates. Debates allows people to take positions that they may not take and dig deep into it. For example, if you um, um, ask someone uh, uh, in a class, uh, uh, in a standard class, uh, is IT good? All of them might say, yes, IT is good. But divide that class and say, uh, one group will oppose it, one group will uh, support it. Now go and debate it. You'll push people to start critical, uh, think critically. And that is something that we in the school system have to bring it back. Debates have gone down. So, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is our education system. 
and I admit, and our education providers, we don't have dreamers in our classroom. You know, if you look at a standard classroom uh, of a final year student in uh, BCom, uh, second year, or first year, how many dreamers you have who will sit down and dream about big, becoming a Bill Gates or a, uh, Forbes? Until you have that, you will continue to confront with the situation of job seekers. There's another issue that hasn't been discussed openly, but in private sessions, employers will be whinging and whining about it. And I don't know why Topaz hasn't been talking about this. Let me talk about this. I think the university leaders are here. They should also think about this. Work-study dilemma. Over the last three decades, there's a marked increase in part-time students. Universities have encouraged this by providing evening classes, as well as studies via DFL mode. Policy is specifically designed to increase the participation of students. There are two major issues arising out of this. Employees are undertaking studies at the expense of quality performance at work place. Part-time students tend to be less prepared for university studies. Consequently, their level of performance is generally lower than that of traditional full-time students. And to accommodate them, rigor of content and teaching are also brought down. I stand to be challenged on this. But I was teaching in a university system for long. This is something that employers need to deal with and talk about it. A lot of our teachers in our school system are doing two units per semester at the expense of students, at the expense of quality time spent to prepare for classes next morning. Ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the critical issues outside the standard quality issues that we need to be deal, deal with. In, within the education system, we are dealing with some issues. And I said, we are embarking on the reforms based on these three pillars. With respect to quality, with respect to delivery, with respect to learning environment. We admit there is problem at home, closer to home, but there's also the whole education industry is vertically integrated. We need to examine the whole vertical integration process. And what we need to do is to engage in discourse. The important members of the community, the society, must start contributing to this discourse. What we see is regular bloggers and letter writers, but where are our frontier people, people who are pushing the frontier, the topics? And I do hope that those frontier people who are pushing the frontier, responsible to push the frontier, will start questioning, questioning the existing norms, questioning the traditions, so that we continue to push the frontier and not less behind. Thank you, and I look forward to uh, some major uh, contributions out of this uh, forum. Naka, thank you.